thanks for all of those that are reading through the book on empowering parents. Now, the first two weeks I've spent building a foundation of the five main responsibilities we have as a parent. Today, I extensively covered our identity. So what you found through the first five chapters of the book was God wants your child to flourish. Sometimes we think we want them to be more successful than God does, and that's not true. Um, that you can uh, position yourself, you can be equipped, you are chosen to be a parent, a good parent. And another thing is you can do it. And what I love about the chapters you read last week was fight now, dance later. I've always said, if you can train them when they're little, you won't have a 15 year old smart enough. <laughs> So, and even if you didn't do it when they were little, do the hard work right now, and then you will dance later in victory. So it is hard work, but you can do it. You're equipped. And another emphasis is asking Holy Spirit. And that's just not parents. If you're a grandparent, an aunt, or whatever, asking Holy Spirit to guide these precious children. And I want to talk to you because eventually we're going to get on setting children free. And I want to tell you that children are very easy. The, and the younger they are, the better on setting them free. If they're bound for anything, they have trust, they have faith, the roots aren't real deep. And so it's really easy to minister to them. So with that said, this next week in the next section uh, called Healing Home, I think it is, you're going to learn how to pick up signals on what may be wrong with the child, she's going to start giving indicators. So this week, it's really important to get these chapters read. Uh, chapters one through five was really, really short, if you didn't notice. Um, these last two weeks, I covered the five responsibilities of a parent, and next week, we're going to start digging into, hmm, wonder what's up with my child, and how do I know? So let me know if you have any questions. I'm really excited about this course. And you can find the rest of the teaching and the downloads at miracleofdeliverance.com forward slash parents. Okay. Imparting identity is mostly what we're going to talk about. If anything you can do, if you can develop an identity in your family, it will change the trajectory of your children's lives. So I'm going to talk to you about how you may want to do that, how you want to form it, and how you might want to strategize on what to train your kids on. So it comes from Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So basically, where is it saying how to train your children, basically, in everything that you're doing, right? So here's some ideas on establishing identity. So identity must be established as early as possible. Unfortunately, we're living in a crazy society. We have a relative of a relative who had a child, and they wouldn't tell anyone who's, and this isn't all about gender, but they wouldn't tell anyone who, who the gender was because they didn't want to force the gender on the child. I'm like, hmm. They wanted to pick a name that was male or female and let the child decide what they wanted to be when they grew up. Unfortunately, they're already causing confusion. Is Dennis making faces? So. <laughs> so anyway, but that's the same way when we don't establish other identities in our kids. You have to do it on purpose. So children rely on their parents to know who they are. That's why it's important for parents not to call their kids names because they will come under that identity. And then they have to end up in my office having to break that off. So impart their identity early. And you can do this by how you speak to your child, how you allow others to address your child, and even how you discipline them. And I remember getting kind of offended when I was a little girl. Mom, I had a cousin named Catherine. When my mom and dad said, hey, Kathy, the mother said her name is not Kathy. It is Catherine. And we were taken aback just a little bit. But what? You were looking at oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, but what that established was, guess what? All of her life, she was called Catherine. 
had she not established that that early on, she would have been called all kinds of different names. So anyway. Come on. So I put this little rusty chain. I said lies attached to identity have an effect similar to rust on metal. It erodes and deforms until it can be difficult to see the beauty or the purpose of the object. Unfortunately, unless you're hooked into the Holy Spirit, you may not even know what lies your child is believing. I mean, there are kids who, it, and it's fine. I mean, my mother was adopted. I have, I have nephews and nieces that are adopted, but there are oftentimes you'll have kids arguing and they'll say, well, you no, they didn't even want you or you were just adopted. And that child will begin believing that. If the parent may not even, it's not true, but there you go. So they are grown up with that identity. Unless you start some communication with them and listen to Holy Spirit, you may not ever know what they're doing. So Israel was to impart who they were at all times, and we can do that too. So I want to give you some good ideas. So talking in the house, you're imparting identity. You're also imparting your gender roles. And I know in this room and online, we have people that are single parents. But what can you do about that? You can find good, if you're a woman, good good men as mentors. And you can also pray those in so that they have those. What do you mean talking? Uh, just how you're talking in the house releases identity. Uh, where you, When you sit, this is basically alluding to Deuteronomy. Impart identity when you're talking, when you're sitting, when you rise up. Um, and use every resource to communicate. Technology, text, Twitters, paintings. There's a lot of people that... Um, depending on the identity that they have in their family, they use different things. Or, you know, this is kind of a simple thing, but I inherited some dishes from my grandmother. And I find some, I find some identity in that. Not my identity really of who I am, but I love that fact. If I didn't pass that on to my children, when I died, they go into a yard sale. So what I began to do is tell Kirsty stories. I knew Kyle wouldn't give a rip. So I began to tell Kirsty stories about these dishes and how I would wash them and then allow Kirsty to help me take care of them. Things that are important to me, I began sharing that with my children at an early age. And you can saturate your environment with the goodness of God and who you are. Even when you're disciplining, sometimes you need to discipline just saying, that's just not who we are. And I'll talk more about that here in a minute. I gave you a handout that basically, uh, and on the miracleofdeliverance.com forward slash parents that handouts there for you to sit down and think about what is our family about what's its character who are we and who are we not and so you may decide that we are people of character and that's how you train your kids another thing is we tell the truth uh, i know a woman whose child man that kid was a liar <laughs> and a liar and a half and, and she would sit down and she was like if you want to be a part of this family we tell the truth. And I remember a day that kid couldn't be broken. And she said, I think she was really little. And she said, do you want to live here? And she's like, yes, mommy. Yes. If you want to live here, you tell the truth. If you don't want to live here, you lie. Anyway, it fixed her. <laughs> I don't, sometimes you need to listen to the Lord, but that fixed her. Uh, we love God and we keep his commandments. That's an identity that you can spread. So there's an analogy here that a potter doesn't look at a lump of clay and go, hmm, it'll be what it wants to be. No, if he does, it'll just forever be a lump of clay. So you look at that, like I talked about last time, praying about what their direction is, and then you begin to mold it. Some artists say that they can look at something and say, you know, that's just a certain picture that needs to come out. I'm not an artist, so I don't know. I did that with, you know, I, I see the beauty. And even in church, sometimes I'll look at a person. There was a woman that she was loose and immoral. But I'm telling you, I could see potential. I could see faithfulness in her. And um, some of the women, they were like, I don't know what you're seeing there. But I, was, I couldn't help it. I could see it because I'd mind. And I saw what was under all of those wounds. And I remember when she gave her heart to God and she got set free, they were like, you didn't give up. And I was like, yes. And there is a reward like that for your children. I mean, they all of their, their identity may, may be surrounded in a bunch of junk that you need to ax away at. But anyway, 
So last week we talked about responsibilities one through four, and the fifth responsibility is parents need to decide the identity. The slide's wrong. Okay, so what's your family's identity? Who is your God? How does your family function in its identity? And these are all things that you decide ahead of time. In the Old Testament, they would stack rocks and tell stories to their children to identify who they were, what their history with God was, and their identity with Christ. And Dennis and I were talking about a couple that we know that they would tell stories to their kids, but it was like adventures they had as teenagers, trouble that they got into. And as the kids got older, they did the very same things. And we're like, why did they do that? Even some of them got into a very early relationship that they shouldn't have and um, or a relationship they shouldn't have. And Dennis said they have the parents, even though they told them that these are unwise actions, they made it sound exciting and thrilling. One thing I told my children not to do was what my mother told me not to do. She said, Lisa, never stare at the sun. You shouldn't have to tell a child to do that. But when she said, don't stare at the sun, I, um, they said I would be blind by the time I was in the fifth grade. You know why? Because I went onto a field and I laid down and I stared at the sun as long as I could. So I thought when I was training my kids, I, <laughs> I did. I, I learned the hard way. <laughs> I told my kids, I was like, now listen, my mom told me never to stare at the sun. And I did when Kirsty got older, she said, mom, why did you tell me that? And she wears glasses <laughs> today because of it. So you want to think about what the stories that you're telling your children and the adventures that you even hear uh, telling other people. So here's some ideas. Uh, they used to have what they called family Bibles. Have y'all ever seen those? You can keep a register in there. Let your child see their name in that family Bible. It gives them identity. You can celebrate victories and visual mementos like making purchase, purchase or gifts. And one thing I like to do, if somebody that I love does something great, and it doesn't have to be, you know, like they solved some kind of earth problem, but if they've done something great, and I knew it would take a lot of work, I like to celebrate. Send them a gift, send them something to eat, tell somebody, make something to eat. And um, each time our children have celebrated, we usually celebrate with a gift. We've not been big gift givers, but we try to do a big gift when those things happen. Um, I know the last time my son got promoted, um, I looked at Dennis and was like, I don't think we've done anything. So we called him and was like, we have to celebrate. Let us know what you want to eat. And we're going to send that to you with whatever that is. Do DoorDash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he and they're used to that. So we celebrate those little moments. And it doesn't even have to be spending money, you could make a place on the refrigerator. It's like, we are celebrating. Stop the family. We're celebrating. They did this and you're affirming their actions and their identity. Now you can do do remember exercises. Let's say that you purposely want to teach your child a lesson. You could be in a vehicle if they don't have their earphones on and they're zoned out. And you can say, do you remember when so and such did such a good job? Or do you remember when Kids like to hear when they were born stories or when you got them stories if they're adopted or um, things they did that when they were little, celebrating them and forming their identity like that. You can point to scriptures and tell stories about family or miracles. Kids need to know about miracles. If you've been healed, when you got saved, do they know your salvation story? Do they know um, grand, grandfather salvation story. If someone got healed, they get their identity out of that. Um, have dinners or celebratory foods for memorials. And one thing that uh, I like to collect China. I don't want them throwing away my China. I said that about my grandmother's dishes. But I also, when I'm celebrating, I don't use my Corel. I typically, if I'm not real lazy, will bring out something nice and serve. It says, I'm doing something a little extra for you. Purchase new Bibles for areas of growth. That's an idea that, you know, I know a lot of people do digital. It's proven that you learn more off of paper, actually. But when they get saved or if they do something important, it's you celebrate their idea, their identity as a believer by getting them a new Bible. If you see your kids reading the Bible, I don't, I mean, sometimes you can say that's a good job, but maybe they need to hear you telling someone. Buffy calls me and say, you know, Isaiah's just been in the in the word. She's not manipulating, but oftentimes it does better if they hear you telling somebody else something. 
Um, when, <laughs> what you brag on, whether good or bad, will show them what's valuable to you. Have you heard what some people brag on? They will brag on the craziest things, but never brag on morals, never brag on character, never brag on their godliness. It's, an, it's, um, it's important for a child to know their identity as to not know their identity. And for this part, I have somebody that's going to come on and tell you something. Um, so our identity as believers is not just saying we trust God, we believe in God, but we also can say we're, we're not we're not cheaters, we're not murderers. This is who we're not. This family is not this thing. So if your child begins to identify with the enemy's identity instead of his identity in Christ, you must be aware and pay attention to the cycle. Remember at the beginning, training, teaching, imparting, modeling, and reinforcing. If you you can look and see that something probably is out of balance with that. So pay attention to what's being modeled in movies. If you're if you are a godly family, yet you're watching junk on TV, you're not re you're reinforcing a wrong identity. You can say all day long, we're people of character uh, in this family. We love yet. They watch you scream at people or gossip about people. They're going to be confused in their identity. So children exposed to heavy doses of media propaganda will begin to identify with what they're seeing. Also, if you notice, how are Christians viewed on um, TV? We were just watching The Good Doctor, and they came on, and this Christian doctor was like, I can't perform an abortion. And everyone else was like her and her religious values, pushing them on everybody. Later on, she comes to her senses. She's like, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor, so I have to perform this. If you watch almost every show, it will take other false religions and make their their characters will be witty they'll be intelligent you have a christian they're always you know got something up their sleeve they're sleazy they're not loving they're conniving well if you're showing that in your family um how are males viewed remember this identity we're talking about most tv shows show males as blundering idiots Find you a good TV show. You probably got to go back 50 years to find one. I think Tim the Toolman does a pretty good job, but he still does some pretty good blunders. So it's normal to see children on the Disney Channel lie and rebel against their parents with no repercussions at all. Have you seen that? They go on dates without asking the parents. They lie to the parents. The parents find out there's no repercussions. When your children are watching this, they are forming their identity and how a household is supposed to be modeled. So if a child fails in our society, the parents are quickly blamed. However, if this child has a special talent or gift, the parents are in no way responsible for this weird cultural paradigm. Because of this, we must teach responsibility properly to our children. The family identity is we own up to what we do wrong and we try to make it right. And you have to reinforce that. I remember as a little girl, my mother borrowed a telephone book. For those youngsters, that's where everybody's phone numbers used to be in a book. And if you wanted to find them, you would look up this number. And all of my mother's other phone books had n numbers written all on the outside of them. So I thought, I'll help her with this. So when she got this no new phone book, I began to write all these numbers, thought I was helping. When my mother saw that, I didn't know it was a borrowed phone book from the guy who owned a grocery store. I was appalled. But you know that she marched me in there and I had to apologize. Probably not the best thing, but I tell you, if you give me your things, I will not harm them out of that. So she marched me in there. Same thing with like, we don't steal. If your child steals, it's not just okay. You have to um, do something about that. You had Landon be apologizing that really made him. Is Kyle Weasel on there? Kyle is here to tell you a story about what we are not as our identity. Surprise. Yeah. Okay. I, somebody just called me. So if you said something to me, I did not hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, I was talking, we're talking about showing fan, uh, kids what identity you don't have. And I wanted you to tell the weasel story about your father establishing who you were not going to be. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember what age I was. I was probably in my teens, I guess. 
But um, when I was in my teens, I think um, there was a family member that we all knew and he was kind of a weasel. He would do a lot of things to say whatever he needed to say to get out of having responsibility or a certain amount of work. And he just had this stigma in the family. Like you knew that's how he was, even though it was kind of unsaid. Um, so I kind of did the same thing. Um, I would say whatever needed to be said so that I wouldn't have to do any work or I could get out of mowing the yard or I don't even remember what this particular instance was, but dad had obviously been fed up about it and uh, was not okay with me acting that way. So one day he kind of cornered me in my room. I don't remember if I walked in there first or why, but he came in there, shut the door, kind of pointed his finger in my face and said, do you know, do you know, and he named our family member. He said, he said, do you know why nobody likes him or something along those lines and named off the reasons like everything that people just knew, but nobody said he named all those things. He said, he's a weasel. You are acting like a weasel and I am not, I am not raising a weasel. You will not be a weasel. You will not be. And then he named that person's name. And so that has stuck with me uh, even up until now. And there's times like even at work, like I'll want to, say something or kind of shyster my way out of a situation. And I'll be like, no, nah, I'm not a weasel. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a weasel. We're proud of you. If you're a weasel, your father would not be happy. <laughs> <laughs> how are you establishing? You have three daughters. So how are you establishing identity with them? Uh, I tell them every day that um, they're not allowed to like boys until they're 18. Um, no, I, uh, it, it comes and goes kind of as needed, I guess. Um, we kind of, every one of them I'm learning are a little bit different. So it takes a little bit of, they each have character traits that tend a certain way. And we just kind of have to counteract that. Like, uh, you know, with, with Lainey, who's my oldest, she's oftentimes in her own world. She's very emotional and she lets them control her a lot. Um, so we try to speak to her first off that, um, Hey, you're, you, you don't need to be the type of person that lets your, that you let your emotions control how you interact with your sisters. Like, uh, and we just try to guide her the way that she handles, you know, her own desires. Right. So even the weasel thing for me, it was mostly, I wanted to do my own thing. Um, and there was a certain way I went about it. Um, one of our kids is a lot more sneaky about it. So we just tell them, Hey, you're not sneaky. You're not going to grow up to be sneaky. You're going to be open and you're going to have, pure motivations and pure heart. And so we really focus on that. And then with another kid, they're not really sneaky. They're just controlled by emotion. So we try to tell them like, Hey, you, you know, you've got to do better at controlling your emotions. You will not be controlled by your emotions. Um, you know, that's not what we're raising you for. And we just try to make that case, of course, explaining it to, you know, their age is a little bit different at times using different examples, but uh, that's kind of how we try to do it. Um, but you know, if you want to ask in 15 years to see how it went, welcome back. <laughs> welcome to house. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right. That's it. Did you like hearing that? Yeah, I always like hearing you. He was kind, though, because I was pretty, <laughs> pretty, my voice was highly raised. He was like, I will not raise <laughs> That's probably the only time I ever hollered at him. He was in the basketball court or anything. <laughs> yeah, I was a screamer. Well, I think I that tells lawyers sometimes is like, if he wants to, you know, yell or, you know, like, mm -hmm. we don't talk like that in our family. Like, your mom and daddy yelling? Mm. No. I'm like, we don't talk like that. Mm -hmm. That's very good. And, and then let's say that you did talk like that and you decide not to, because in this class, we all will realize, oops, then just repent to your child and stop doing that thing. It's pretty easy to do. Yeah, I'm not really that angry. I need to have to die. Oh, boy, I how am I going to do I think you're not driving. I can yell angry something. Five times, but until I raise my voice, I do not get hurt. So I don't know. Like I can get her on my level, and I can talk to her. But until I raise my voice, she will just keep doing what she's doing. I feel like my kids are the same way, but I feel like they they know that it's not until I get to that point am I going
like recently I've been started to make a, this rule that I'm only going to tell you once and then I'm not telling you again. Then automatically comes the repercussions of it, the discipline part, because I'm tired of raising my voice. Because the only time they want to listen is when I yell. Then when I yell, they're like, oh, she's fe we're fixing the trouble. Now, well, this so was your very wise woman tell me that about the first, uh, she, she told me I was babysitting her kids and she said, listen, they listen the first time and then there's the consequences because yeah. she said, it's not even just in for your convenience. She said, it could be a safety issue. So what if they run out in front of a car and you tell them stop and you train them that you, they don't have to listen to a third time? Like, that is we late. both didn't first time when they went towards the car. <laughs> they get no she, warning. She told me, she was like, anything they do, they listen. So, Norma is saying someone told her early on that a child listens the first time and then there's consequences because they could run out in front of a car or do whatever. Do you have some wisdom with that? Oh, there, I think I, I got little snippets that I put in the back of my mind and say, and they have a lot of meaning to them, but the one snippet reminds me of everything. And the one I think I mentioned to a guy in a meeting today, we were making jokes, but I said, your children will live up to the expectations you set for them. And what I mean by that is your kids are living up to the expectations that you set for them. So there's no complaint to be had. They, they're successful and they're doing that. You have to change the expectation. You have to set the boundary, hold the boundary mm -hmm. and, and do that. They'll also, that also goes the other way. If you tell them they're a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God, they'll attempt to live up to the expectations you have for them. So it, it, when you're not making rules for them or when you react to something, they're just doing what they know works. That's what we yeah. all do. Whatever nature lets us do, we'll get away with it. It's really you good. Know? So you really, you really, you have to. It's like the Pastor says when you, today is when your new life begins and you start changing things. So, if we were in that situation with a preteen or somebody in that area, uh, what we would do is sit down with them and we draw a new line and we tell them what the old, why the old line wasn't good. And from today forward, you need to understand. But you have to do it with your kids, I think, especially what, when it's easier when they're young. What is an appropriate like? If you set the new expectation, you say I tell you once, what is the consequence? I think you have to decide with your kid. If you if you expect that they're going to fail or try you, and you don't want to break your own heart, then you need to set yeah, the that's... well. What you, what you <laughs> need to do so you don't want to break your own heart is you said you can set a level of progressive discipline. But the first thing needs to hurt enough that it doesn't hurt you, but hurts them. Mm -hmm. So whether it be you know no TV for a week or give me your phone or you know whatever whatever something that affects them but won't break your heart. Use that first, but let it be progressive. I mean, you have to get to, you know, I've had to tell you, I've had to tell you twice, three times now, it's going to be this. At some point, you may have to progress to where it breaks your heart too, but whatever it takes, you need to go through. They just need to know that you're serious about it and not tease them because they'll try it if they've been doing it forever. You really, it really comes down to you just can't say you're going to do something and not do it. You have to have integrity in your discipline, just like you do if you're telling God you're going to do something, committing to something, then you talk through it. My opinion, sorry. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's a little bitty thing. So that's why parents let the little bitty thing. You can't let a lie go. Parents will laugh at a lie. They'll laugh at uh, kids doing crazy things that you wouldn't want them doing if they're 15. That's why you have to get a hold of that now. Okay. Parents often absorb all responsibility and consequences and leave none for the child. That may be y'all. That may not be y'all. But if a child steps off the path, remember we're the path setters, the parent must illuminate the path and allow the child to face consequences of bad decisions to stay on the right path. Larry Brown said that. Do y'all understand what that is? The, you know how many parents, they keep getting their child out of jail. They keep bailing them out. They take all of their, they take out all of the money they have saved to rescue this child that's going to get in trouble again the next day. There are no consequences. A, parent, a teacher gets on to the child and the parent takes up with the teacher and alleviates any other authority. There are people that believe, you know, that we are the only authority in our child's life. While I do believe a child needs to be able to know how to speak to an authority that's being aggressive or abusing or whatever a child, they also need to learn respect of authority. So here's some, uh, some examples of identity discipline. If a child steals a piece of gum and you have him write, I'm a bad boy, that's terrible because they are not bad. That's their identity you're talking about. Yeah, they can say I did a bad thing, but you can explain to them in this family, we don't steal. A piece of gum today is a dollar out of mama's purse tomorrow and it's something out of somebody's locker the next day. So have them sit down and think about reasons 
why they should not have stolen it, and consequences for stealing. One of the most beautiful things you can do, even early on, is your child to understand consequences. Now, this ha this can work even before they know how to write. I have papers at home. Kirsty always wrote little zeros. And so if she and Kyle got into a scuffle, I would say, I want, depending on their age, for her age, I want you to give me two reasons you shouldn't have done that. And give me two reasons. After she does that, I'd say two reasons something bad could have happened because you did it. She could write that down. Now, when I would take that paper where she made all the zeros and I would say, why, why shouldn't you have done that? She could tell me what that said, even though I couldn't read it. She could tell me the consequences. And then as they got older, we developed longer ones. I never said, you read the Psalm 91 for your punishment. What is the word or is God a punishment? No, he's not a punishment. So I think punishments would be better off if they actually were tools we use to turn around to help a child not do that again. So then later on, let's say they're tussling on the stairs. Not only is it a good idea to do this, but I, it, it allows you to gauge their maturity, their ability to think and reason, their ability to know the consequences, how much you can trust them when they're at somebody else's house. So the both of them are tussling on the stairs. One, they were just playing at first and they hit the other one. And then finally, you know, one hits the other one too hard. So the other one shoves them and then mama gets involved. And so you say, OK, right now I want you to sit down and you're going to write 10 reasons why you shouldn't have done that. Now, if all you're talking, I can't think of why I can do it. You've got it could be their will not wanting to write it down and confess it but they may not know if they begin the, the first stages are going to be good. They're going to say, because mom might not like it because God may not like it. But what you're wanting is I could have harmed my sibling. I could have broken their arm. I am in this family. We don't hurt each other. And I hurt my, my sibling or I could have, that's what you want out of there. So as you're developing these discipline, you're going to see where they're at with their thought processes. We kept a lot of ours because they were hilarious somewhere out in the building. We have lots of Kyle and Kersey's. I never wasted writing a hundred sentences of I will not. That never worked for me in school. I always chewed gum in class the next day when they tried to do that to me. I figured it wouldn't work for the kids as well. So if your spouse hears you say the word, I hate you, and those words bring forth a harvest of hurt that, imp that literally imprints on their soul. Imagine what praying and speaking life brings into a person's environment and soul. I don't know I have a question mark there. But that was a quote that Pastor Jones had said. So we want to we work on imparting truth and life in them and imprint truth on them. We are truth tellers. We tell you the truth. If you've already established you're a truth teller, Get, they hear you telling somebody where they're just a bad boy or they're just a bad girl. You've just ruined all of that. They know you're a truth teller. So you've just imprinted something that's not in their identity. Here's another thing. In training your child how to work, when Kirstie went to the University of Kentucky, uh, she called me and she's like, hey, mom, there's 18 year olds down here in the laundry room. They can't make the washing machine work. She said, Mom, the directions are on the lid. <laughs> <laughs> they were, she was listening. They were calling their mothers saying, how do you wash it? They are in freshman. Good job, Joel. Freshman in college. I'm sure their parents, that was a shining moment when their child called home to work this mysterious box. <laughs> so we need to train them in simple things like that. In this family, we pull our own weight. In this family, we don't leave things for other people to do. We don't leave dirty underwear in the floor for somebody else dishonoring a parent, dishonoring someone else to pick that up. In this family, we honor each other. So if you want a family identity that your children are capable of being fully functional grownups, then consider training them early and consider giving them responsibilities according to their age. Now, I thought these were some pretty cool things like are there responsibility chores they can do? Now, this is according to their age, but maybe they can order the meal. Maybe they can plan the meal. Maybe they can do research for a family purchase. Like if you all decide, hey, we're going to purchase 
a TV or new glasses or a new product. Have that child do all of the skills they typically would do on YouTube or whatever and present their case. If your child wants something, say, well, do the research. Let me know what the review, the reviews are and why this is a better product. You've just taught them critical thinking that they're going to need later on. They come back from the cheapest website too, but mom, I've got it for $50 on and you're so because and in this family we're frugal. <laughs> we raised a dumpster diver, by the way. We did raise a dumpster diver. <laughs> Our daughter is very frugal. We order every plate, and it comes with like the instruction part. So Ainsley gets to get on there, and she picks out the meals that she wants for the week, and then it comes and it has the instruction. She can cook the whole meal by herself, all step by step by step. I love that because later on, if she wants to put the foods together, Amber's talking about this meal box that she gets that comes in and it has all the instructions. And so Ainsley at 11 years old, she can cook a full meal. So that's pretty cool. What about this says map, mapping out a travel route. I wish I had that because I am terrible geographically and don't always do for them what they can do for themselves. Yes. And then we need to work on not being critical when they do it and it's not met to our expectation. You know, pick your own outfit out. I imagine Ella and Tuesday could come up with some fancy oh, yeah. outfits. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And sometimes I'm a little bit embarrassed to walk through the store with them. <laughs> I know that we used to do Ainsley, like I would do Monday, she would do Tuesday, so I would do Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Every other day. I'm not there yet. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <hold my daughter. laughs> they, well, they fixed her own hair for school today, so Tuesday's got like this ponytail with like this big hump hanging down, and then she decided she was gonna braid that piece into that piece, and so it's like two ponytails connected <laughs> over here, and then she's got the bowl kind of halfway hanging out, and, and then Ella done her hair, and Ella's like. Oh, Miss Lynette really liked my hair. And I'm like, did you tell Miss Lynette you did it all by yourself? <laughs> I hope you told her. <laughs> I was like sending a message. I think there's <laughs> times that it doesn't. It doesn't hurt to let them express unless it's inappropriate. Why not? I remember Ainsley coming to church. She like crazy shoes with a wild fluffy skirt with pants under it, like orange and yellow. And when she walked in, Amber's like, Oh my. That's so long ago, Ainsley. We cared for you. And I was like, I know Amber did not let her do that. I was just waiting for Amber to come. And sure enough, the next thing I look up, Ainsley's got a hoodie on. I did too. I was like, where did she come from? Because it wasn't out of the car with you. Yeah. I left her in charge with this. <laughs> and she got out of there and I was like, where is your shirt at? Where was that at? She had been laying on your couch and she had took her sweatshirt off. So she had like this crop top and she was walking oh, okay. around the church and her belly was showing. And I was like, yeah, I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> Lisa was on stage and I was like, go get Lisa's keys from her office and go get your shirt now. <laughs> um. <laughs> This talks about making a commitment um, that you, well, here's the problem. A lot of times it takes a lot of time for these kids to do the things. So being patient once you allow them to do it. I like to take over. They're helping me cook. I take over because it's faster, more efficient, and less of a mess. But there are times for that. But giving them an opportunity to perform is a good thing. Well Okay, here's some notes of caution. While we should release responsibility as they bear it, children are not equipped to make final decisions. And many decisions should not be given to children as an option. I'm in the deliverance room with an adult who has um, issues. And so we ask the Lord, Father, would you, there's guilt issues, there's shame issues, feeling worthless issues. And I said, okay, God. Would you show her the root of this, whatever is causing this? And she began to cry. She was about eight years old. And her, uh, I, I think it was that she had an animal that bit her. And she loved the animal, but it turned violent. And so the parents, probably thinking they were doing a good job, they, they said, we're going to let you decide if we take it to the pound or not. 
And so she's terrified, but she, she doesn't know really what this means until later. So they put the dog and she's petting the dog and they're, and they're like, again, you make the decision whether we take this dog off to be put down. So she feels guilty. She feels unprotected. Then later on discovers what they probably did with that dog and guilt and shame. So we, for, she forgave herself, forgave her parents. And I said, honey, that wasn't your decision to make. A parent should have made that decision. And she did get free from that, but she lived in guilt a long time. So uh, allowing child the, the portion of responsibility in decision making is bad for them. We need to be a parent. Uh, but children do have a voice. They speak out of their identity and from their path. This does not mean they are the boss or have final say, but their voice is important. And what was it your Dennis's father passed away when Dennis was 10. So um, there was different issues with my father actually stepped in to father him later on. But uh, what was it that your dad used to say about um, speaking your mind? Do you remember? You, I think Becky said he would say that you... You could you could say what you wanted to say, but you had to be respectful while doing it, or something like that. Yeah, he used to say that. He taught it more to Becky. I think he probably got most of that conversation okay. from Becky. But he was like, "Hey, you should always say what you need to say, but you need to do it with respect." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the kids, they should be able to say anything, but not screaming in your face. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if they if they complain and yell, "Oh man, that's not fair!" Do they get a voice? They don't get a voice. They want a voice in this family. In this family, we're respectful. If you want me to hear you to hear me, you're going to do it at a normal level. You're going to do it without a fist raise. You're going to do it with honor. And then as you facilitate that, they learn, hey, my opinion matters, but it also matters how I present it. Then later on in life, they know how to communicate with adults. Have you ever gone into the roadhouse or talked with a teenager that just doesn't know how to talk to an adult? I was so I'm, I'm just like, what is your problem? Or it makes you feel like, you know, you have cooties or something. But it's that no adults ever talk to them. They don't know how to communicate. OK, so this one is we're almost finished here. The problem with a blind spot is you can't see the thing unless you get a different view. And they preached on that last night in revival. So you need to depend on trusted mentors to point out, point out potential blind spots in your training plan. And I think I mentioned this last week whenever my friend Cassandra pointed out, did I point that out last week? She said, you favor one child over another. And it was a blind spot because I got on to Kyle before I did Kirsty. So you will not be able to model everything your child may need. Be prepared to find good mentors in their lives to fill the gaps. And the local church is a great place for gap fillers. But listen to Holy Spirit. Just because somebody looks spiritual doesn't mean they are. And just because they go to church with you doesn't mean, mean you need to be sending your kid to their house. It is true. It's not. That doesn't mean that it's safe. The first pornography I know of one child looking at happened to have been somebody in the family coming over and they're staying someplace, not their home. And that was their first glimpse of it. So we want to be we want to protect them, especially when they're in other environments. OK, I have questions, but we're out of time. <laughs> so they're on that pay those pages. If you want to just take a look at those and. Um, answer those. If there's anybody online, you guys have any questions, you can un, um, do your microphone and chime in if you want to.